Hello and welcome to a new edition of Scroll Books. Uh, keeping in mind the subject that our guest today has written about, I briefly toyed with the idea of opening this episode by uh, launching into an argument with him. But hey, I have a strong instinct for self-preservation. Uh, had I been sadistic enough to attempt to pick a quarrel with Mehdi Hassan, he'd have uh, set up a booby trap, lightly tossed me over his shoulder with a judo move, slammed me with a zinger, and then fished a receipt out of his back pocket. Uh, just some of the many strategies he discusses in his book, uh, Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. Hello, Mehdi, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Nourish. That's probably the best <laughs> intro I've heard for my book on any media interview I've done so far on this tour. Enjoyed that. Uh, many of us here on the subcontinent first became aware of Mehdi Hassan's rapier, sharp debating skills when we saw a clip uh, of him from the Oxford Union in 2013, persuading a seemingly hostile audience that Islam was indeed a religion of peace, that violence in some Muslim-majority countries is the consequence of political factors, not inherent to the faith, as many detractors have sought to claim. He's now the host of the Mehdi Hassan show on MSNBC and NBC's Peacock TV in the US. And clips of this argumentative uh, person of Indian origin interviewing yet another hapless victim go viral on social media with satisfying regularity. Mehdi Hassan, we live in an era of intensifying political polarization where it seems increasingly difficult to find common ground with people who hold differing views from ours. In this climate, why do we need to uh, conduct effective debates? Because the debates are coming for us, whether we like it or not. This is one of the reasons I wrote the book. I would have written this book at any time in my life, but to write it now was deeply appropriate. Uh, I felt that it had to be done now because too many people think, well, you know what? I'm not a debater. I'm not a public speaker. That's for you, Mehdi. That's for people on TV. That's for uh, Naresh at Scroll. It's not for me. I keep my head down. I mind my own business. The problem is we can't keep our heads down anymore. We can't mind our own business. You live in a country. I live in a country. A lot of people live in countries where democracy is on the line, a free press is on the line, where reality is being questioned, where truth isn't truth, apparently, to quote Rudy Giuliani, where facts can be alternative, to quote former Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway. So the, the time for, you know, uh, you know, keeping your head down, uh, you know, having this kind of kumbaya, let's all just get along, let's not argue, let's not disagree, that's gone. If it ever existed, it certainly doesn't exist right now. So in an era when bad faith merchants and gaslighters and serial fabricators are taking over our public spaces, our public squares, our media, our politics, I wanted to write a book to say, hey, this can, I can give you skills that will help you not just at the dinner table, not just in a job interview, not just with your career, but also on the big existential level to try and push back those of us who are small D Democrats to try and use rhetorical skills of debate, of argument, of persuasion to try and push back against people who are trying to degrade our public discourse. Um, you write about how your father, I think, uh, who was from Hyderabad, encouraged a climate of discussion at home. Uh, tell us about that and especially about that book he put on his shelf. So it's the late 1980s. I'm about 10 years old and the satanic verses, Salman Rushdie's notorious uh, Islamophobic novel that upsets a lot of people to the point where some Muslims in the north of England are burning copies of the book. Uh, and my father buys Satanic Verses. He reads it cover to cover and he places it on the bookshelf right next to our dining table. And every time we have friends over for dinner, Muslim members of the community, they're shocked. They're aghast. Why would you have this book on your shelf? And my father replied, because you cannot understand or condemn anything until you read it first. And that was the atmosphere in which I was raised. That was inculcated me for, in a, from a very young age. Question everything. Um, ask for receipts. Ask for evidence. Don't blindly swallow what anyone tells you, whoever they may be, uh, friends, family, political, religious leaders, whoever. Uh, have a healthy sense of skepticism. And try and see all sides of an argument. And that's one of the things I stress in the book that, you know, to quote John Stuart Mill, you cannot know your own side of the argument until you know the other side. And not just any side, the most plausible other side, the strongest version 
of the other side of the argument that you're making. So that was uh, putting me from a young age. I was always encouraged to speak out, uh, to speak in front of a crowd. Public speaking uh, was something my father and mother encouraged. I, you know, I acted in school plays. I did school debates. I turned up at Oxford University in 1997 and I throw myself into the Oxford Union Debating Society, uh, where I thoroughly enjoy kind of rhetorical combat. And, you know, was it partly nature? Was I born this way? Maybe. But also it was partly nurture. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is to say, not all of us come out of the womb like this. Some of this stuff is developed over time. Some of this stuff we pick up through our experiences, both personal and professional. And in the book, I say, look, I know that I've been like this since I was a kid and you may not have been, but let me teach you how to be like this because it's useful to be like this in all walks of life. It's, it's a skill to be able to win an argument. It helps you in life. You know, over the last few years, um, like I just said, the volume of our debates seems to have gone up. Uh, what do you attribute this to? How much, of, how much has social media changed the way we talk to each other and argue with each other? I mean, social media, well, before I get to social media, let me take a step back. Are we arguing more? Yes. Is it good faith argument? See, I, in the book, I distinguish between good faith and bad faith disagreement. I'm all for good faith argument and debate. I'm not a fan at all of bad faith argument and debate. In fact, I, those are the ones I avoid. Uh, there was a, you know, a chapter that I should have written in the book, maybe in the sequel, which is when to walk away from an argument. I'm one of these people who loves to argue, but I'm not going to argue with people who question reality. I'm not going to argue with conspiracy theorists or Holocaust deniers or election deniers. I'm not going to argue up is down, black is white, hot is cold. That's a waste of my time and it's an insult to my audience. So when you say arguments have increased, what kind of arguments, what quality of arguments, what nature of arguments? We've clearly increased the number of bad faith arguments. You're in India. I've watched Indian television debates. I've interviewed Indian politicians and commentators. It can descend very quickly into pointless uh, shout fests that don't educate or illuminate. I host debates on my show, but I make sure they're good faith debates involving actual experts, not just two people shouting for the sake of clicks or virality. So we have to kind of define our terms, as I say in the book. Um, but to take your point about social media, social media has been a blessing and a curse. It's been a blessing in the sense that it's amplified new voices. It's given platforms to people who didn't have platforms before to air their views, to opine, to share their expertise, to communicate across countries, continents in a way that we never could before. But it's also been a curse in the sense that it brings out the worst in us. And I include myself here. When we're online, we do look for the kind of quick dopamine hits, the dunks. Uh, the hot takes, uh, the not considered views, and the arguments that don't rely on evidence. It's very easy on a Twitter platform to anonymously just throw allegations out and not have to share your identity or your name and not have to share evidence. When I argue on Twitter, I try and also bring evidence. As I say in the book, show your receipts. You have to have your evidence. But social media allows people, allows light, you know, there's the famous phrase, right? The the, the the lie goes halfway around the world before the truth gets its boots on. Well, that's been taken to the you know the hundredth level by social media. Mm. How do we conduct effective debates in an era in which we can't even agree on what a fact is? Uh, how do you deal with this? I mean, it's not easy. There is no silver bullet. Uh, for a start, I would say exclude, shun ostracize those people who don't believe in facts, who don't want you to believe in facts. Or I should rephrase this, they do believe in facts, but they cynically want their audience to believe there is no such thing as a factual reality. As I say, uh, as I've said many times before, the gaslighter, the Donald Trump figure, when they are pushing nonsense at you, they don't want you to believe them over you. They want you to believe no one. They want to break down trust in all institutions, because that is how authoritarianism thrives. That is how the strong man emerges, when people lose trust in everything and everyone. To quote Steve Bannon, the former Trump advisor, our opponents are not the Democratic Party, they are the media, and the way you deal with the media is to flood the zone with excrement, is the, the word he used, another word. Uh, so that is the reality of what we're facing right now. And I think when you're facing people who don't trade in factual reality, uh, I have a chapter in the book called uh, Chapter 11, Beware the Gish Galloper. This is the person who wants to throw a load of nonsense at you, cherry pick statistics, inaccurate facts, uh, lies, distorted studies, and they throw it at you at speed, with intensity, with relentlessness, nonstop. 
Uh, and Trump is an example, but there are many others. And in fact, it's named after a, a creationist Christian called Dwayne Gish, this tactic of Gish galloping. So by the time you've rebutted lie number three, they're on to lie number seven. By the time you've rebutted lie number seven, they're on to lie number 15, and you just can't keep up. You're overwhelmed with BS and nonsense and conspiracy. And I say in the book, it's not easy to defeat that, but there are some things you can do. Number one, you can pick your battles. Don't try and fight every battle out there. Rebut the main, most pernicious, most ridiculous lie that your opponent is pushing. Number two, don't budge. Too often in the media industry in particular, interviewers will move on to the next topic without addressing the fact that the guest has not dealt with the question, has not answered it, or has just said nonsense in response. I say don't budge. Less is more. Ask fewer questions, but make sure you get answers to your questions. And number three, call this stuff out. As you say, call it out. Tell people this is what's going on. They don't believe in facts. They want to push conspiracies. This is all misinformation. Take a step back and remind your audience, because sometimes we forget about the audience, the audience watching at home or the audience in the auditorium or the audience around the dinner table or the audience at the boardroom. Remind them what your opponent is doing. Call out that technique of BSing. As you point out, um, you don't conduct every TV debate uh, with uh, the aim of convincing the person you're interviewing. It's yeah. to uh, convince the person at home. How yes. do you do that? So you have to be aware of who your audience are. The very first chapter of my book, Win Every Argument, is called Know Your Audience. Because there is nothing more crucial when it comes to persuasion, when it comes to winning an argument, when it comes to triumphing in a debate, than to understand who is it you're trying to win over. Sometimes we get so lost in trying to uh, come up with an argument that sounds good to us or an argument that might persuade our opponent that we forget. We're not the target. Our opponent's not the target. The target is the audience watching, the neutral third party, as it were. And so we have to be able to tailor our messages and our arguments and our claims uh, to that to those people. So, you know, whenever I do an interview or whenever I go anywhere, I was speaking in Michigan at the weekend on book tour. First thing I do was do my homework. Where am I speaking? What's the city known for? What kind of crowd will it be? What ethnicity? What demographic? What religion? What age? What are their professional backgrounds? Because then I can tailor my message to those people in a way that they will understand, appreciate, and connect with. And I think that is so crucial. Sometimes we forget this. Those of us who are journalists forget, you know, who are our readers and viewers? What, what are they worried about? What do they want to hear? What do they need to be given in order to be persuaded? Which facts, which statistics, in which possible, you know, we have many platforms there. As you mentioned, social media. What is the best way to convince people these ways? Is it with a short, snappy video? Is it with a graphic? Uh, is it with a soundbite? We need to think about how we reach people in different ways. I'm on TikTok now with my show. I never thought my, my teenage daughter is aghast that I'm on TikTok. But I'm there because there's an audience who can be reached in a different way. And the way we put our TikTok videos online is not the same way we put our TV show on YouTube. You have to be able to tailor your message in a different way to different audiences. And then you can get through. Don't give up. Don't be defeatist. Don't think these people are beyond us. No. You've got some pretty scary stuff in your book. You know, the stuff I mentioned, booby traps, judo moves. Uh, how did you boil down these debating strategies you've learned over the years into 300 pages? Uh, I mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's a book of 16 chapters. I could have written 32 or 48. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world of debate, rhetoric, and argument. And as I say, this book tries to do a lot of things. It's a very practical book, but it's for a general audience. So when I'm writing this book, I'm thinking about my fellow journalist, who I want to give advice to in the chapter on Gish Galloping. I'm thinking of the politician who I want to give advice to in the chapter on emotion, especially the liberal, the leftist, the progressive politician who isn't good at emotion. Right wingers are much better at being demagogues, at connecting with the emotions and rousing their base. So I wrote a chapter on that. But I'm also thinking about the person who's going into a job interview. What skill set do they need? What tips can I give them? I'm thinking about the person who's at the Thanksgiving table, as it were, with their crazy Trump loving MAGA uncle. How do they connect with that person? How do you connect with... What if there's no audience around? You're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. What if it's someone you love and care for? You don't want to beat them up, but you want to change their mind. How do you connect with them? How do you listen to them, show empathy? So I'm thinking about multiple different people here, from the lay reader to the politician to the lawyer to the journalist to the person at work. And I'm thinking, OK, how do I assemble the different skills? And these are not just my skills. Of course, I'm not that arrogant to say I came up with this. A lot of this stuff goes back to Aristotle, to Cicero, to ancient Greece, ancient Rome. The art of rhetoric has been around for millennia. And I'm trying to digest it in different ways for different people. Again, I'm thinking, who are my audience? Who are my readers? What do they want to know? So maybe 
somebody in India who buys the book finds the chapter on emotion to be more relevant to what they're trying to do. Maybe someone who finds the chapter on judo moves, which is basically my rhetorical tips for avoiding getting pinned down, for getting yourself out of a hole when your back's against the wall. What, what techniques and tricks can you use to turn things around? Maybe they'll find that chapter more useful. Maybe, maybe the student will find the chapter on doing your homework and research. Uh, important because that's something I spend a lot of time on. A lot of people say to me, how do you do your in-depth interviews? How come you always have these quotes and stats? Because we do the work. My team and I, we do the research. We spend a lot of time going through somebody's background and their statements and the facts surrounding them. So I would like to think I wrote a book which appeals to people from across the board, different generations, different ethnicities, different walks of life, different professions. And yet it was hard to boil it all down. The way I did it very briefly, the first third of the book, the section one is about the fundamentals of debate and argument, emotion, logic, um, the art of listening, the importance of humor. The middle third is about, you know, it's the spicier stuff, the judo moves, the booby traps, the zingers, how to really corner your opponent, knock them off balance. And the last third is kind of what some might call WBD, worthy but dull, but it's not dull, but it is worthy. It's the hard work you have to do behind the scenes, the preparation, the practice, the delivery, the homework, the brainstorming, the building up of confidence. That's the last and probably the most crucial part of the book. As you point out, um, a crucial part of the art of debating is the art of listening. What did you learn about, what have you learned about listening over the years? So I say this in the book, that when I told my wife I was writing a chapter on listening, she kind of stared at me for a long time and then she burst into laughter. She said, you're writing a chapter on listening. You're a horrible listener, which is true. I'm not a great listener. I tend to interrupt. I tend not to pay attention. I tend to talk too much. But that's one of the reasons I had to write it, to say, look, even people like me who do this for a living, who people say are good at this, even I struggle with certain important skills. And it is an important skill. You know, there's the old saying, you have to open your ears before you open your mouth. It is so crucial for multiple reasons. And the two main reasons I give in the book uh, to be able to listen. Number one, critical listening. You can't win an argument if you're not paying attention to what's being said by those around you. If you're not listening out for a contradiction uh, or a false statement, how can you rebut someone if you haven't heard what they said? And we think we're listening, but as I say in the book, we're not listening. We're waiting for our turn to speak. And number two, more importantly, and this applies outside of the world of debate and argument, just as a better to be a better human being, is empathetic listening. The idea of listening with a sense of empathy, putting yourself in the shoes of the other person, trying to understand what they're trying to say, where they're coming from, what their purpose or point is, to show that you're fully paying attention, that you're fully present. That's much harder. It's the highest form of listening, to quote the great author Stephen Covey. So I talk about critical listening and empathetic listening in the book, both from a moral perspective, it's the right thing to do, to listen to an audience member, to show that you care about what someone's saying. But it's also self-serving. It's strategic. If I can, if I've heard everything you said and I've listened very forensically, I'm going to be able to pick holes in your argument much better. Over the years, you've interviewed uh, demagogues, uh, demagogues and autocrats uh, from now across the continents. Yeah. What um, draws them together? What, what do they have in common in their debating strategies? Well, what's interesting is that I started doing a show for Al Jazeera English where I interviewed people from across the world in 2012, 13. And around 2017, 2018, I'm in America doing my show Upfront, a weekly show out of the DC studios of Al Jazeera English. And I'm also doing my show at the Oxford Union in England for Al Jazeera called Head to Head, on which I've had Indian politicians like Ram Madhav at the BJP. And one thing I notice about the Madhavs and the people from Turkey and the people from African governments and the people from Eastern Europe and Western Europe is they all start to sound like Trump. I'm hearing Trumpian ticks from all of them. They're all saying this is fake news. They're all trying to throw a blizzard of false statistics at you and hope you won't notice. They're all trying to shout and talk loudly. They're all trying to attack the very nature of the media and the free press. And I'm thinking, I guess success breeds success. Trump won in 2016 with those awful demagogic tactics, anti-media approach. And I guess people around the world said, hold on, if it works for the president of the United States, if it can work for a man like Donald J. Trump, maybe it'll work for me. And that was very worrying when people say, oh, you know, you're obsessed with Trump. You talk a lot about Trump. Well, Trump didn't just have a domestic impact. He had a global impact. And when I talk about autocracy, when I talk about the rise of authoritarianism, I am saying it is a global phenomenon. We are seeing it across the world. And that's why the book is for people across the world to learn how to speak out and push back 
against people who abuse our language and abuse our public spaces and abuse our media, whether it's in Boris Johnson's England, uh, now Rishi Sunak's England, or Viktor Orban's Hungary, or Vladimir Putin's Russia, or Erdogan's Turkey, or Trump's America, or Netanyahu's Israel, or Modi's India, or Bolsonaro's Brazil, now Lula's Brazil. But they are everywhere. And this is not going away anytime soon. So when people say to me again, oh, we're in a polarized climate, why would you want to further polarize it by singing the praises of argument? The argument's already out there. I'm just saying, here's how you win them. Um, from uh, all those uh, thousands of kilometers uh, away uh, from your uh, studio and your home in America, what does India look like to you now, that this land that your, your, your parents left? So it's a land my parents left Hyderabad in the 1960s, 70s, but off, you know, still spend a lot of time. And I used to spend a lot more time there. Um, I used to go to India every year as a kid. I got married in India. I love that country, but it's depressing to see what's happening. Just as, you know, I, I'm associated with three countries, right? My family are from India. I was born and raised in the UK, and I'm currently a citizen and, and a, a journalist in the United States. All three countries have been plagued. Uh, by authoritarianism, by the rise of the far right, by attacks on the media, by attacks on minorities, including my own community, the Muslim community. And it really depresses me to see what's going on. And India seems to be on steroids compared to even the US and the UK. I look at your media. I look at what's happened to NDTV recently, which I was a great fan of. I've appeared on. Uh, you know, just the other day, I was looking at the numbers, phenomenal numbers. In 2002, Nourish, Reporters Without Borders in their World Press Freedom Index had India at number 80. Number 80, 80 in the world. Today, I think it's something like 180, which is crazy, a crazy shift in just 20 years, in just this 21st century. Press freedom is under assault in India. I see it. I saw what happened to the BBC recently with the quote unquote tax raid after the BBC ran a documentary on Modi. Um, I see what's happening in the politics. Uh, it's astonishing what I see what American politicians say, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, and then I see what Indian politicians say. Some of your politicians in India make Marjorie Taylor Greene look like a flaming liberal. So it is very worrying to see what's happening to, you know, the world's largest democracy. Uh, you know, I'm in the world's oldest democracy, as they proudly brag. And in both of our countries, America and India, similar things are going on, similar forces at work. And those of us who believe in small d democracy, those of us who believe in a free press, cannot keep our heads down. We must engage. We must speak out. And we must def we must defend basic principles. People say, oh, journalists, you must be neutral, impartial. I'm not neutral, impartial when it comes to truth or reality or the very future and existence of democracy. One final question, Mehdi. Um, what is the most satisfying rhetorical victory you have scored uh, in your career? <laughs> well, one of the, I, I don't, it was definitely satisfying. Uh, it's probably one of the most famous, so I'll share it with you all in case your viewers, uh, listeners haven't seen it. I interviewed a man named Eric Prince, uh, who was the founder of the mercenary company Blackwater in Afghanistan and Iraq. He's also the brother of Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, very right wing figure. Um, and I interviewed him at the Oxford Union in front of a live audience for my then Al Jazeera English show, Head to Head. And there's a famous moment that went crazy viral. It actually ended up with him being referred by Democrats in Congress to the Department of Justice for accusations of perjury, because I confronted him about testimony he had given in Congress under oath, where he had said, where he was asked about his contacts with the Trump campaign, and he said he didn't have any. And I confronted him and said, here are all your contacts with the Trump campaign. You were meeting with Donald Trump's son in Trump Tower. How come you didn't mention this? And he said, I wasn't asked. And I said, remember this is in front of an audience who start laughing. I said, you were asked. No, I was never asked. I said, you were. We went through the transcript and you were asked and you didn't say any of this. Oh, I did say it. Did you? Maybe the transcript's wrong. It's a hilarious exchange, which is a testimony to having the receipts, to doing your homework. My team and I went through the entire transcript, very long transcript of his testimony uh, in front of Congress. And it's a great moment to sit in front of a live audience on television and have a guest denying something which you know is a false denial because you've got the receipts. Physically, I've got the receipts in my hand. Here is the transcript. So it was a great comeback. And uh, it actually, uh, it made me famous in the US and probably helped me get my job at MSNBC. So I always joke, thank you, Eric Prince, for helping me with my career. Well, thank you so much, Mehdi Hassan, for being with us. Uh, everybody, uh, Go out and get his book if you want to know how to pull those spectacular moves and uh, do, uh, as he points out, uh, uh, 
uh, compile a dossier on him, uh, Google him, make sure that you uh, spell his name with Very one true. S instead of two, otherwise you'll find yourself uh, talking thing. about uh, getting information. Ruzzles. About, I wrote a book uh, about arguments, not Ruzzles, no. <laughs> but thank you so much, Mehdi. Thank you, Naresh. Enjoyed it.